Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the Gospel reading, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, read just moments ago. You may be seated. Sorry about the microphone. It was switched the other way yesterday, so I keep wondering whether I'm on or not. So we'll get it straight by the end of the service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I was thrilled when I saw that we had this text again, because this is such a fun text. And it seems, at least to me, like forever since we've had it. And so today, although we have three fantastic readings, this particular one just could not get by me. There are a lot of little details in there that we could fill in. Some of them I will share with you, but not all of them. We want to focus on three major things that we learn from this text. Now, to start off with, we're given a clue that something really good is going to happen within the first few words. On the third day. The third day, the eighth day, the first day of the week, those are always connected with the resurrection, with Sunday, with Jesus rising from the dead. And that always tells us that something important, something significant, something beautiful from God is going to take place. Then we find that there is a wedding in Cana. Excuse me. Cana, some say, was a rival town of Nazareth. Jesus being from Nazareth, you may recall that Nathanael was from Cana. And when the Savior was announced to him, he said, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? So it's important that if that really is true, which many say it is, it's a little up for grabs, but most say that they are rival towns. It's important to note that this miracle takes place there, not on his home turf, but in a rival town. Now, that's pretty cool and exciting. Then we also want to note that there is this big wedding. Now, you've got to understand that weddings in those days, especially in small towns, were a big affair. They still can be, especially in small towns where everyone is related and friends with everybody. And even those who don't get along usually are invited to a wedding. The place is filled. And it is assumed that there will be a big party, a big celebration following the ceremony. That's exactly the way it was in Jesus' day. Remember, hospitality was extremely important. It was one of those, if you didn't do it, there was disgrace. So we have this big wedding taking place in a small town, a rival town, on the third day. And we read that Jesus' mother is there. Now, why is she mentioned in such prominence? Well, she seems to know the inner workings and what's going on behind the scenes. Somehow she knows that they are out of wine. And this believing mother goes to her son. This is one of those shining instances when she remembered who he was and what he was all about. And she came to him certain that he could fix the problem, that he could do something. And she tells him, but Jesus puts her off. That will lead us to our first big point. But what I want you to notice also is that though Mary is so prominent, though like Luther, all of you know that like Luther, she has got to be my favorite, an example of pure servanthood. Notice what she says. She tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, we hear about Mary later on, and we hear about her being there at Pentecost, but these are the last words recorded from her mouth in Scripture. I think it's very significant that the last words we hear her utter are words that point us to her son and tell us to do whatever he tells us to do. With that all in mind, we get back to this putting off that Jesus does. Some think that that's a little disrespectful, but I'm here to tell you that the first big point is timing is everything. We don't always get the answer that we're looking for, and we don't always get what we want, and none of it always happens on our timetable. This believing woman brought the need to Jesus, and Jesus will fulfill it at the proper time. 
is also referring to his major work, his crucifixion and his rising again for the salvation of all. But here, even in this small instance, it is very obvious that timing is everything. We, like Mary, must bring our request to the Lord. And then we must patiently wait for his word, for his action. Sometimes that's very difficult. I often wonder what went through Mary's mind. And yet in this believing moment, perhaps it was very easy for her to accept. And so we move on into this particular miracle. And we find that when it is time, we have 20 to 30 gallons of water in each water jug. And that water is turned to wine. Jesus makes not just a little bit. He makes 120 to 180 gallons. And the party has already been going on for a while. But what is the really deeper meaning here? This wine is the best wine. And Jesus produces it to rescue this couple in their need, this family. There's a personal intervention into their daily trouble. You see, if the wine had run out, if the party had gone dry, so to speak, that would have been a lack of hospitality. That would have been not preparing in advance. That would have been something that people would have remembered, and it would have been a disgrace that was marked upon their life for the rest of their life. That's the one thing people would remember. But notice what Jesus does. He intervenes in a very personal way. And isn't that exactly what the life of Jesus is all about? He knows our personal need, the greatest need of all. That we be rescued from sin, death, and the devil. That we be freed from our bondage to sin. That we be brought back into fellowship with the Father. That we enjoy the gift of the Holy Spirit and the new life that is given to us by his death and resurrection. He intervenes in a very personal way to rescue us from disgrace. The disgrace of sin that sometimes puts us in disgrace before one another. Because we are sinful human beings, it definitely puts us in disgrace before the throne of our Heavenly Father. But Jesus intervenes on our behalf to wash us clean in his blood, to give us new life, to take away the stain, the blot, the disgrace, and to make us new children of God, able to stand before our Father, not by our own works, but by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, able to speak directly with our Heavenly Father, no other mediator now needed but Jesus, who opened the way and gave us access to the throne of grace. He intervenes on a personal level for you and for me, and he still does that. He still is involved in the daily life of the world. He still is involved in our day-to-day -day activities. It's not as if he came and did his work and then went off to heaven and sits there twiddling his thumbs while the clock runs out. Some believe that. They are sorely mistaken. On every page of Scripture, we see God in action for his people. And that has not changed. We may not have times when we are imprisoned for our faith and the gates swing wide open and an angel leads us forth. We may not have those kind of really big, obvious things go on. But there are plenty of other times, aren't there, when we look back with the eyes of faith that we can see where God has been involved in our life and provided for us. And all we need to do is look at even the daily things in our life, our daily bread, and know that God provides for us. So often we look at the scarcity of what we don't have, at the struggle that we have perhaps to make ends meet. And yet, we must be honest that we are very rich people. We are wealthy beyond compare. Not maybe in worldly goods, but in relationships, in the love of God. And yet, even in our 
possessions in this world compare us to the majority of the world and even our poorest in the United States are so abundantly blessed compared to so many throughout the world. God would have us to open our eyes and see those blessings that he gives to us and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that he gives them to us in abundance. And that's the other thing about this reading. Notice Jesus doesn't make just a little wine, just a little to get him through. He makes 120 to 180 gallons of the good stuff. That's the way he does everything. Our God is a God of abundance. We see that especially in his grace. For every little sin that we do, every little sin which is equally damning as the big ones, for every sin that we commit, we have the whole life, the death and the resurrection of our Lord to cover it. He poured out all of his blood to wash away each of our sins. Now, if that isn't abundance, I don't know what is. There is always more than enough grace to cover our failures and our disappointments. He reminds us that that abundance is what he wishes to give to us. He asks us, then, to come with our needs and our cares, to place them into his hands and to wait For his answer and his action. He asks us to open our eyes and to see him at work in ways that we perhaps never would have imagined. To see him at work, not only on the tree of the cross and in the blasting forth of that stone from the tomb, but to see him at work in our daily lives as well. And to rejoice always in the great abundance that he gives to you and to me. For by his grace, you and I are the very children of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.